It's energy, Russia, and really gold uh, I want to turn to now. Matt, I want to ask you about gold. You're the gold ETF, GLD. That's the biggest one out there. Uh, I believe it was a new high, a 52-week high on Friday. Very heavy volume there. And yet, I, I'm kind of surprised it's not up more. I mean, we all hear about this gold's a safe haven story. This is like the greatest safe haven play potentially out there in many years. I, I hate to be cynical, but why isn't gold higher at this point? Well, I mean, gold is at a 17-month high right now. So there has been upward momentum within the spot price of gold. And it's a result of, you know, what we've seen from this, you know, geopolitical instability, right? What's going on right now in Ukraine? And that has been a benefit to gold prices in terms of that, you know, long-term volatility mitigation properties it has. I think in terms of, you know, to your question why it's not higher is, you know, there is some sort of counteracting forces to it. Uh, if the dollar continues to strengthen, you know, that typically is a headwind to the spot price of gold. Similarly, you know, we, we still don't know what Federal Reserve policy is going to look like. We're going to get a great indication on Wednesday when Powell speaks to the Congress. But if the Fed continues on, as, as Raphael Bostic had suggested, with a 50 base point hike, you know, that can be counteracted to the spot price of gold. So, you know, in any instance like this where there's some significant market volatility, gold would be sought after as that, you know, potential safe haven asset to mitigate some of the volatility. But there are other macro forces at play here. And I think that just speaks to the type of volatility we're seeing where, you know, it's impacting the commodity complex, it's impacting the dollar, policy decisions are in play. It, you know, this is this is impacting pretty much every facet of the global capital markets. Yeah. Jan, do you buy into that? I mean, I hate to be argumentative, but, you know, it is the great safe haven play. You, you run the gold miners ETF, the GDX. You run the junior gold miners ETF, the GDXJ. Uh, and they they have outperformed in the last couple of weeks. But but do you think gold should be higher or, or do you think we're we're trading fine here? No, I, li I liked what Matt had to say. Gold competes against real interest rates. But my point is, these commodity cycles are multi-year cycles. And so just like it took 10 years to get into this bear market, we're not going to be out of it after eight months or whatever, you, however you want to count it. So I think we've got a lot longer to go. And if you look at the 1970s and the 2000s, gold actually was a second half player. One of my colleagues says that. For the first five years of these those big bull markets, uh, gold underperformed commodities. But in the second half, it really shone. So if you think we're in a longer cycle, definitely keep your gold and, and uh, add. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's the question. Um, are we in a longer cycle? Uh, Todd, um, where else can investors turn beyond just the GLD? Um, are you seeing demand elsewhere in, in the gold space? I'm talking about gold ETFs? Where's is money coming in here to this space? Yeah, so gold ETFs and other precious metals ETFs have been extremely popular. Commodity ETFs in general are about 10% of the overall net inflows that we've seen year to date. They represent a much smaller part of the ETF pie. In addition to GLD, which Matt's team runs, which is the heavyweight within the space, it trades the most. We've seen some cheaper or lower expense ratio products a GLDM, which is also from State Street. We've seen AAAU, which is a Goldman Sachs ETF. We've seen iShares, IAU, and IAUM. These all have lower expense ratios. They're more for the buy and hold as opposed to the trading audience that's going to benefit from the liquidity that GLD has. So we've seen broad-based demand for gold ETFs. GLD has been the heavyweight, but we are seeing some of the more moderately sized yeah. and cheaper products gain ground. So, Matt, GLD is kind of like the SPY for the gold business. It's got a higher expense ratio, um, but it's used by the active traders because it's, it's liquid, like SPY is. If you actually want to be a long-term buy-and-hold guy, you, you wouldn't own SPY necessarily. You'd own something cheaper. If you want to be a long-term buy-and-hold gold, GL, you wouldn't necessarily own GLD, right? I mean, it seems like you've kind of got it both ways here. You've, you, you've got a high-liquidity slightly higher priced product in GLD and SPY, but you also have other products that are cheaper, not as liquid, but, uh, you know, are more long-term buy and hold vehicles. Or am I, am I characterizing that right? Well, no, I mean, G much like SPY, GLD, they can both be held for strategic long-term asset allocation decisions. You know, the, the liquidity properties can be really beneficial to large institutional buyers who are moving in size. You know, because when you are making those allocation decisions, liquidity can be extremely important, and particularly if you're moving, moving at a large size. But I think you're right. You know, GLD is, you know, no pun intended, the gold standard in terms of 
allocations with respect to gold in the ETF market. And you know, I think it's going to continue to be heavily utilized by a multitude of investors, whether you're you know, short-term tactical because of that liquidity profile or, or long-term, just given its heritage in, in the space of being around since 2004. And I think it, what we've seen in the last few days, of course, speaks to that credibility of GLD. Yeah, as we saw volume spike, we saw a multitude of investors utilize it to make those allocation decisions. And I you know, sort of continue to see that as long as this volatility stays in place.